Josh Schimmel. Uh, Dr. Schimmel grew up in New York City, then moved up to the wilds of Northern Vermont to study at Middlebury College uh, before continuing his PhD work with Mary Firestone in uh, Berkeley, then postdocs, I think, in Aberdeen and Michigan State. Yep, you got it before working at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for six years, and then moving on to uh, University of Santa California, Santa Barbara, where he's been since. He's been a department head there, now an associate's dean. Uh, he uh, has quite an illustrious career. He's published over 200 papers. He has uh, quickly approaching 50,000 citations. Um, and let's see what else. Oh, also has a book that is a top seller in uh, writing uh, on Amazon. Uh, so quite a uh, wealth of knowledge. And today we'll be he'll be talking to us about uh, linking microbial and ecosystem processes. Thank you again. There's a new book that came out this summer called Your Future on the Faculty about being a faculty member, but that one's still quite new. It's about how universities work or, or sometimes don't. Um, so anyhow, I'm very interested in scale in, in soil processes and, and, and in bridging scales from the microbial scale of down at the level of microns to the scale that we actually that we actually take samples at, which is usually a soil core all the way up to ecosystems. And this is the Northern Alaska Tulip Lake, which I won't be talking about. Um, but the how do we do this? And how do we use information from one scale to inform us and to educate us about what's going on at other scales? So to go from microns to meters, you, we you have to use various extrapolation techniques. To go the other way, we're using interpolation techniques to try to figure out what the microbes are doing. And we're always juggling these multiples of processes to figure out what's going on in our systems. So doing that inherently involves models of some sort, intellectual models or mathematical models. But we always need to be thinking about what is the model that we're working with? How are we thinking about these systems? And what are the assumptions that go into creating those, those models? Models are being defined by their assumptions. And how are they limited by those assumptions? And we also need to worry about, are there different controls at different scales? I can't understand the Arctic tundra if all I'm doing is studying microcolonies on, on sand grains. And we need to think about what are the things that link across scales. So we can look at the soil microbiome in all of its great and gory complexity. And if you look at images of, of this and analyses, you see that whole complexity. And you can sequence everything that there is to sequence in a soil and find that there's on the order of 10,000 taxa in, in a soil sample. But against that 10,000 number, I'll put up the big number three, which is a challenge to us when we're doing interscale work, because there's only three types of carbon in the century model. Century is one of the standard biogeochemical models we use for describing carbon and nitrogen cycling at regional and even global scales. And instead of having 10,000s of things in it, there are three flavors of carbon. There's active soil carbon, there's slow soil carbon, and there's passive soil carbon. And they're not even defined by their chemical characteristics, but just by their turnover time. And yet we can use this model to describe patterns of soil organic matter through the Great Plains of the US, which was what it was originally designed for, or actually for modeling soil carbon dynamics at the global scale using only three flavors of carbon. So there's a challenge in between these scales of the microbial scale of thousands of individual taxa, many of which are probably essentially redundant with each other versus three pools of carbon that have no chemical identity even. And yet it works pretty well. 
And there are no types of microbes in this model. Microbes are completely invisible in the century model. They're embedded within rate constants and partitioning factors, but there are no actual microbes involved, no growing, no dying, no decomposing. It's all just about carbon moving from one pool to another. So they get away with that, not by assuming that microbes don't exist. Century knows that the rate constants would be zero if the system were actually sterile, but by assuming that microbes are in equilibrium with their environment to such a degree that you can essentially model past them. If you know the drivers, you can predict their responses to predict the outcome. And so you can build sort of response functions of relative water content versus decomposition rate and just multiply your, your predicted rates by, um, by this, this factor and you'll get the rate based on whatever the water content is without worrying about what the microbes are actually doing in the middle there, even though that is clearly who's responding and how they're responding. In contrast, if we wanted to try to model things based on a microbial system, we might build initially a biogeochemical fluxes of carbon or nitrogen, and then add into that you know, data from metagenomes and transcriptomes, which are gonna give us thousands of signals. The problem of course, is that that's just mathematically intractable. There's no way to map thousands of independent variables onto just a couple, a handful of around 10 dependent variables. Somehow you've got to collapse the measurements way, way down, or you've got to expand the model up so that you've got the same number of independent and dependent variables. Now, I think this is likely to be essentially nigh on impossible to do it in the raw form from just straight metagenomes to biogeochemistry, you're gonna to have to extrapolate out or rather extract out some nuggets of insight that maybe you could relate to function. What Century can't get rid of is clay content. That if you look at the two different maps of soils, a sandy soil versus a fine textured soil, the average carbon level in, in the sandy soil is around three kilograms per meter squared. In fine textured soils, it's about four and a half meters squared. You can't ignore the mineral composition of the soil because it creates a 50% different value for just how much carbon will be stored in that soil. And it also controls some of these partitioning factors between slow and passive soil carbon. So you can't, you can ignore the microbes, but you can't ignore the mineral phase. That shows up as well in this paper from Craig Rasmussen and, and, a, and a crew of others. We're looking at soil pH and the relative contribution of, to organic matter stabilization. And you find that at different pH ranges, you find different mechanisms that are stabilizing soil carbon. So again, you can perhaps ignore the microbes, but you can't ignore the mineral phase. It's vital in understanding what really is regulating things. So if we come back to the idea that there are three types of carbon in, in, in century, we rapidly run into a conundrum though, because where century only knows about three types of carbon, when we actually analyze soil carbon, we get complex, very complex mixtures of things where there are hundreds or thousands of discrete types of molecules in carbon. And in their kind of now classic paper, Marcus Kleber et al put together this diagram of what they think soil organic matter looks like on mineral surfaces, where there are different zones and different types of molecules that are found in each of these different areas, hydrophobic interactions here, holding molecules together out here, you've got more hydrophilic molecules, but these are all relatively small, identifiable, measurable, and potentially small enough that microbes could take them up, which raises the question of why then is soil organic matter so apparently stable and why does it carbon date so old? 
often if you go down, particularly if you go down below the rooting zone, soil carbon can date a thousand years old or more. But if it's simple molecules like this, is it really just this mineral stabilization that's that's protecting that so the microbes aren't getting access to it? But but clearly there are lots of discrete molecules, and we need to somehow incorporate some understanding of how that operates into our perspectives on soils and soil organic matter processing. So looking at the way people are thinking about soils, there are microbiologists who think that microbes rule. There are the mineralogists who think that the minerals rule, and we know that minerals are really important in regulating soil. And then there are the organic chemistry that's the least developed of all of these areas, and in fact, probably the most analytically difficult of all of these different areas of analyzing soils is tomorrow we holiday we have all? something that molecules rule which leads me to my idea of this is more of a democracy with three political parties in it and which one is actually dominant will vary over time and space so it's really all, what i like to call the democracy of dirt knowing full well that for soil scientists, dirt is a word you may not actually Hopefully speak aloud. Place can I have a PhD like in soil science, so I think I'm allowed to call it what I want. So Besides that, the democracy of soil just doesn't have the, the, the ring to it. So this is the way I like to think about soil as more of a, a democracy where we need to be doing a better job of thinking about all three of these dimensions <laughs> Who they how they interact with yeah, each other. The DOD is often and so I'll protected. talk about that some yeah, in, in like terms of California ecosystems where I've done a lot of work I don't know how that would in recent years. And this idea that Century has of that you can model yes. past the microbes, so the, assume that things are in a quasi steady state. Yeah. But if the climate is relatively yeah. constant, yeah. the so microbes will have equilibrated yeah. with the climate yeah. and with the vegetation, and, so and, and the processes like will therefore be relatively so predictable right. so based on third just third the, third the third ultimate third drivers. Third but of course, the world is not quasi steady state. So, if we look at landscapes like yeah. behind, up behind Santa Barbara in California, yeah. well, yeah. this is what my the hillside but behind my house looked like part. some. 10 years ago, or I guess it's more than that now, when we had the tea fire and the, we thought our house burned down that night. Um, or the creek in front of our house that flooded and is actually flooded to various degrees several times since we've lived there. So quasi steady state is really more the exception than the rule. And when we look at trying to model but that's an, e an ecosystem like Santa oh, Barbara yeah. in was, Southern California, where you have a su summer drought where it typically doesn't rain at all for six months. And then we have a winter wet growing season. You guys got the tail end of the storms that came through Santa Barbara last winter. Um, and we try to model that using a model like Descent, the day daytime step version of the century model. In dry, pulsy years, when most of the rain came in, in in rare episodic pulses, and then like if I'm trying to predict stream nitrate export, for example, did a horrible job. <laughs> Whereas in the wet years, <laughs> where the winters were more constant, yeah, it did a better good. job. Not great, perhaps, but yeah, a better job. But when we looked at the seasonal patterns, descent could capture early spring okay, capturing late spring poorly. And capturing summer, really not at all. They sent just cannot capture this dry, dry summer dynamics um, at all. So really, this century perspective in a dry, pulsy, pulse-driven environment did a miserable job. So somehow we need to go beyond the assuming that microbes are in equilibrium with their environment. We need to introduce some measure of, of actual mechanism into these processes so that we can capture the real dynamics and we can explain them. The question is that we do need to be more mechanistic. The question is how much mechanism and which mechanisms do we need to introduce? The microbiologists would probably like to put microbial communities into the picture. The mineralogists are gonna to wanna to put minerals. 
and the organic chemists are going to want to put organic molecules. Which of those is really going to be the most fruitful way forward is not at all obvious. And how to blend those different approaches is equally not at all obvious. So I want to focus on a phenomenon that was first identified by Birch in 1958, which is that when you take a dry soil and you rewet it, you get a pulse of respiration. And each time you rewet a dry soil, you get a pulse of respiration. And, and the, this has raised the question of what causes those pulses, which again is surprisingly not obvious. Several hypotheses are that this is microbial death, and these are dead microbes being metabolized by their survivors. It may just be release of osmotic agents that microbes accumulate within their cells when they're dry and when they're wet, they're no longer necessary. So they release those compounds and metabolize them. It may be though that rewetting a soil causes physical disruption that mobilizes soil organic matter that those now soil, soil organic matter constituents become mo mobilized and can then be degraded, or most likely it's going to be some mix of these. But what causes these rewetting pulses is something that's interested me since I was a graduate student. So one approach we took to testing this, the, the mechanism was work that Noah Fear did when he was a graduate student in my lab a number of years ago where we added C14 glucose to soils. We incubated those into the microbial biomass for eight days, dried the soil down for three days, and then re-wet it and measured CO2, microbial biomass, and dissolved organic carbon. So we're trying to see where the C14 went to in those systems. And what we saw was in two separate experiments, first one and then this later one where we repeated it, we see CO2 evolve, get a nice peak, declines, dry it down, spike it up, dry it down again, follow the C14. The microbial biomass was enriched to about this level of two to four becquerels per gram carbon. Um, mm -hmm. But the dissolved organic carbon was cold. There was a major release of DOC that we could measure, but it was not radioactively labeled. And this raised the question of, so the microbial carbon is released on rewetting. We get this highly enriched spike of fresh carbon that's released on the rewetting pulse. But the question of what the DOC is and when it's metabolized or is it metabolized um, and what's its chemical form at this point, we didn't know. So we're seeing two things going on. We're seeing the spike of CO2 that seems to be coming from the microbes, but we're also seeing a spike of, of dissolved organic carbon that's released that's not being metabolized. And we were, we were wondering as well then, is the carbon that's released from the microbes Osmolite carbon is that bacteria produce compounds like proline and glutamate, trimethylglycine. They also produce trehalose as an osmoprotectant. Um, fungi seem to produce more glycerol and mannitol when, when grown in pure culture as osmolites. And in pure culture, these costs are, can be very large. As much as 30% of cell carbon and as much as 60% of bacterial cell nitrogen can be tied up in these small, highly mobile osmolite compounds that a cell has to get rid of very rapidly on rewetting, because otherwise water will flood into the cell and they'll explode. So we set out to measure them through several years in the field, July 07 through November 09, measuring glutamate, trimethylglycine, and proline and we didn't see anything that looked like evidence of these being osmolites. If they were osmolites, they should have been increasing during the growing season and going down, or sorry, increasing during the dry season, going down during the wet season, going back up in the dry season. But in fact, we saw peaks during the wet seasons, 
and then this peak in the middle of the dry season, but it went back down before the first rains. So we're not seeing any real evidence of, of these classical osmolites. In fact, when we represent them as a proportion of the microbial biomass, microbial carbon was relatively flat. <clears throat> Glutamate, tri uh, trimethylglycine, these various compounds, mostly glutamate, um, are as a relatively constant fraction of the total microbial biomass. And so as the biomass grows during the winter, so does the glutamate pool. As the biomass goes down with the beginning of the summer, so does the glutamate pool. No evidence that this is acting as an osmolite whatsoever in the amino acid compounds. So we looked at another experiment, this one done by Amy Miller, a postdoc in my lab. She did an experiment where she rewet soils either every two weeks in red or every four weeks in blue. And what we saw was that when you rewet a soil, you got a spike of respiration. It then came down back to baseline as we dried the soil out again, the respiration came back down to baseline. And then you rewet it again and you get another spike. But the spikes, when we rewet every four weeks, were twice as big as they were when we only rewet every two weeks. So something's happening during the dry, dry phase that's programming in the size of that spike. And the longer it's dry, the bigger the spike becomes. So something is accumulating in the soil that's then available to be respired rapidly on rewetting. But what is that? Is that some? Is this a microbial biomass thing where the longer the so cells or soils are dry, the the more biomass becomes respirable? Is it osmolites? Is it something else? Well, when we actually compared these these numbers and compared to control soils that were held at constant moisture, the rewet soils, the two week and the four week and this is their average moisture accounting for the fact that they're dry some of the time and wet some of the time, they respired a lot more CO2 than did the control soils, even those that were, that were incubated at optimal moisture. And that difference was about 1,000 micrograms of, soil, of carbon per gram dry soil. And that was more carbon than was actually in the microbial biomass. So either just drying and rewetting was sterilizing the soils by killing all the microbes, which was clearly not the case since there was a perfectly happy microbial community left, or this carbon is coming from some other source than microbial carbon. It's coming from a mineral phase being released by rewetting and then being respired by the microbes. This is mostly being driven not by the microbial biomass flush, but by that flush of DOC that becomes available for microbes on, on further incubation. The question is, was, is this carbon that, that's accumulating being released by extracellular enzymes that will be remain active in the soil and maybe remain active even while soils are dry if they're sitting attached to fragments of particulate organic matter, is it possible that they're just continuing to break that material down? So Eric Slesarev and Pete Homiak did a study where they incubated fresh plant litter dry, either under chloroform or without chloroform, chloroform to kill the microbes and prevent microbial growth on the material. And what we found was that the activity of these various enzymes was the same whether or not we incubated with chloroform or not. There's just very slight differences here. So the enzymes are clearly present in this dry litter, but we didn't see any. Oh, am I hitting the wrong button again? But none of, we didn't see any evidence of accumulation of breakdown products. So the enzymes are present in the dry materials, but they're inactive. So this clearly the carbon that's released by rewetting is not carbon that had been mobilized 
by extracellular enzyme activity. It's carbon that's being mobilized from the soil mineral phase. It's not detrital breakdown compounds. What happens when you take a soil through multiple drying and rewetting cycles? We think that this should be very stressful to the cells, but in fact, microbial biomass goes up. This was a paper by Shirang Xiang in which we ran soils through multiple drying rewetting cycles and in surface soils where there's large pools of available carbon, soils that were incubated continually moist were gained a little bit of biomass. Soils that we dried and rewet gained a lot more. Soils from deeper in the, in the, in the profile, so from the B horizon, showed the same pattern, but much more extremely so that we could grow up a lot of microbial biomass just by drying and rewetting, drying and rewetting, that this carbon is mobilized by rewetting and is becoming available to the microbes. And this was not microbial carbon, this was mineral carbon that's becoming available. What's the nature of that carbon was the next question. And so in this work by um, Martin Vetterstedt, who is visiting the lab from the Netherlands, we carbon dated the CO2 released during the rewetting pulses. And what we found was in surface soils, the carbon dated about 300 years old. In the deep soils, the carbon dated from 660 to 850 years old. So particularly in these deeper soils, we're able to mobilize pretty old carbon just by drying and rewetting. This is carbon that is is freshly, um, is highly edible, it's easily degraded. Microbes can process it very quickly, but it's cer certainly quite old. Now, what's going on? What are the mechanisms involved in this? Well, one possible mechanism is what I call the cupcake on the high shelf model in which the carbon is, is highly labile, but it's just out of reach. And it's just sitting there out of reach, absorbed on clays, trapped in micropores until we come along and re-wet soils. And the way we tend to do these experiments is just by pouring water on them. And so we, we re-wet with a lot of energy. Real re-wetting is probably done much more through just capillary percolation, maybe re-wetting with a lot less energy and a lot less inclined to mobilize carbon. But there's another hypothesized mechanism that I think might also be involved beyond just physical protection and physical isolation. And that's some new ideas that J Jacob Waverka has just published a paper on in Soil Biology and Biochemistry. And that's the idea of chemodiversity. And that idea is that when you actually look at soil organic matter, it's made up of these hundreds or thousands of discrete individual molecules and to metabolize any one of them, a microbe needs to have the right enzyme to convert these different compounds into central metabolic pathways where it can use them. So there's an economic cost involved in using any particular molecule. And if there isn't enough of that molecule to pay off that investment cost, a microbe might just leave it sitting on the, on the, on the shelf just because it's not worth it, not because it can't do it, just because it's just not, not economically viable to spend a couple of thousand carbons to get five or 10 copies of a molecule or even five or 500 or a thousand copies of a molecule, you'd better be getting a lot of that molecule to pay off the investment costs. And when we look from surface soils to deep soils, for example, we go from an environment that's dominated by fresh plant material. So a lot of cellulose and hemicellulose made up of simple sugars, lots of glucose, um, lots of other simple sugars to down deeper below the rooting zone in the B horizon, for example, where most of the material is made up of my microbial detritus, my dead microbial bodies. So there's probably much higher diversity of molecular compounds there's also a lot less of, of total organic matter down deep. And so that maybe that the chemodiversity coupled with the low concentrations might explain why that deeper soil is old and stable 
and that maybe rewetting it mobilizes enough of those materials to actually then make them available in, in high enough concentration for it to be worthwhile for microbes to metabolize them. So Jacob built a, a relatively simple soil organic matter um, model in which there are extra intracellular enzymes, sorry, um, that can process metabolic carbon that can be converted into structural biomass. These can be metabolized to produce CO2. This is all microbial carbon. There's a pool of dissolved organic molecules that can be supplied from external inputs or from mineral associated organic molecules. He built the model, he wrote all the equations. We wrote, we developed three different versions of the model uh, making different assumptions about how the microbes deal with this chemodiverse system. In standard soil carbon models, there's a, all, all substrate is just available carbon. So all substrates are essentially the same and microbes can process all of it. We built a model where we assume that microbes practice dioxy, which means they use the most bioavailable forms first, and everybody is using that. And only once they've used that most available form will they go on to the next less available forms. We, has, we built another model where microbes can use some mix of everything in a co-utilization strategy. And we built a version where different microbes rely on different fractions of the, of the pools so different ways of assuming what microbes are actually metabolizing from this pool. And we came up with data that look like this. These are the co-utilization co dioxy and the specialization, different numbers of substrates and the relative assimilation and change. And what we see in all of them is when concentrations are low, that the more substrates there are, the lower the total assimilation of organic matter is. That either microbes will just leave these molecules alone entirely, or because microbial metabolism is second order with substrate and enzyme concentrations both playing a role in, over, in regulating the kinetics, that when you've got very low concentrations of these individual molecules, their individual reaction rates are gonna be quite low. And the overall picture leads to one where if you look at the pattern when substrate concentrations are relatively high, the number of substrates don't make that big a difference. Everybody can be processed effectively, but as a substrate concentration declines, that the difference between one, one substrate and say 50 substrates gets pretty huge. And so in a system where there's actually potentially hundreds of individual molecules, that by itself may be explaining part of why the soil organic matter from these deeper layers is carbon dating old until you mobilize enough of it that it becomes available for the microbes. So what we found here was that microbes may ignore substrates, or it may just divide the decomposition effort across too many different substrates, creating these economic consequences. And then so chemo diversity su suppresses uptake in every version of the model that we developed and, and tested. This is still very much at just the pure theory stage. The next step is to try to figure out how to actually explore some of these ideas experimentally, which is not straightforward or obvious and requires very sophisticated analytical capabilities, which really means talking to the Department of Energy and the PNNL labs up in Richland. So how then does the organic matter flush drive the microbiological processes is the next question. And um, this is some data from a paper by Sarah Placella in Mary Firestone's lab. She was actually working on soils from the research site that I work at at the Sedgwick Reserve in Santa Barbara, and they were following messenger um, R, right, sorry, ribosomal RNA to look at what are the active communities at different time points during a rewetting experiment. And what they found was that early on following rewetting, so within like 15 minutes or an hour, is they see a lot of RNA from the actinobacteria over time that's overtaken by the bacilli 
And then later on, only after about 24 hours, are the proteobacteria taking over. Well, we did a similar experiment on similar, very similar soils from the same area. And instead of seeing actinos before bacilli, before proteos, we were using BRDU, bromodeoxyuridine, which is assimilated into DNA and can then be, that DNA can then be isolated independently and sequenced. And then, so we extracted after 12, 24 and 48 hours. And what, what Dad Rue Michelet, who is the postdoc working on this found was that early on, we see a bit, an initial flush of proteobacteria followed by bacteroidetes and only after 48 hours do we really see the actinobacteria picking up. So we saw proteos before bacteroidetes before actinos. So where Sarah saw actinos first, we saw them last. Where she saw proteobacteria last, we saw them first. So the question here is, is it really just that actinos are holding on to their ribosomal RNA? And so we see it in the, in the freshly rewet soils, but they actually respond slowly. That would be my hypothesis is that these different groups are showing different patterns, but that the BRDU actually is showing the growth response following rewetting and it's pretty dramatic. So we know that, that rewetting is, is mobilizing carbon is growing microbes and it looks like the microbes that respond most quickly to that is in fact proteobacteria, which is what I would have hypothesized. Of course, my hypotheses are pretty often wrong, so we get used to that. We're also interested in the issue of mineral release and how wh what is the carbon and how does it is released and made available to microorganisms. And so this, sort of just to illustrate the importance of release from carbon from mineral soils from a paper by Andrea Gilling in Ecology Letters. This was, she was taking issue with, with my nitrogen mineralization paradigm paper. She had the, 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 the courtesy to invite me to be a co-author on this piece, which I thought was pretty cool. She's a pretty cool lady. So this is work from, by Eric Slesarev, who was a PhD student in my lab. He got soils from across California, and you can see the range in the, in the characteristics of all these different soils from these very pale yellow, low organic matter soils to these lovely chocolate brown soils. He measured water extractable organic carbon, what we call WEOC, and he measured microbial biomass using the substrate induced respiration method and compared that to the pulse of carbon on rewetting. And what we saw with WEOC was a pretty good relationship in both A and B horizon soils that the more, the, the bigger the WEOC pool, the more the, the pulse, the bigger the pulse. But with SIR in A horizon soils, we saw a really good relationship. The bigger the biomass, the bigger the pulse. But the B horizon soils showed no relationship at all. Low, pool, low levels of microbial biomass potentially pretty good sizes of pulses, but no relationship there. So the WEOC and biomass are poorly correlated and the, um, and the pulse seems to be a, an additive function somehow of both WEOC and microbial biomass. So it's both the amount of available substrate and the size of the biomass together seem to explain the size of the rewetting pulse. So this is a more complex dynamic where microbes are probably releasing some materials, but they're also taking up stuff that was already present in just the soil water. Now the different soils show different responses as well. So when we compare what happened in Cedric soil, which is a smectite dominated clay loam formed on marine sediments, they're both mollusols versus hopland, which are loamier soils formed on sandstones, where Cedric starts with this initial spike in respiration that then declines to a basal level. The hopland soils show a growth response. And when we compared these different responses against soil pH and compared the, the, the three hour versus the 24 hour response, hopland soils show up here, Cedric soils show up here. There's a pretty clear patterning um, 
uh, that relates the mineralogy to the nature of the rewetting pulse, which reinforces our idea that this is largely mineral, minerally released carbon that's being processed by microbes. So then we did an experiment to look at how the physical environment of the soils influence the nature of these responses. So Eric took soils where we took soil cores and we flipped some of them upside down, we put them back in the ground and we left them there for a year. So we're just changing the physical environment, taking deeper soils and putting it in the, in the surface where they wet and dry and heat and cool and just be a more physically dynamic environment and taking the surface soils and moving them down a little bit deeper. And so it looked like this. We initially sampled the soils. We, we incubated them in situ with, with this screen mesh on it to try to keep seeds out. And then we came in and harvested them a year later. Periodically, we, we, we weeded the bare microcosms to prevent plant growth and incubated them in situ. We analyzed four separate treatments, A horizon soils that we sampled from the A horizon, B horizon soils that we incubated just in the B horizon, the intact B, B horizon soils that we brought to the surface that we, that we prevented plant growth in, and B horizon soils that we brought to the surface and allowed plants to grow in. And we saw data that looked like this. Similar patterns to what we saw before with WEOC versus Pulse and SIR versus Pulse. But, and here we have the A horizon, we hear down in, 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 um, in yellow, the soils that were incubated at depth, the B horizon without plants. The B horizon soils with plants though, we see start looking more like the A horizon soils by allowing an injection of fresh carbon that we see a response where they're behaving more like A horizon soils, but the B horizon soils are staying um, low. Um, yeah, that's all I needed to say. So then we also took these soils and we, we did an incubation on them where we measured high resolution time courses where, we're, where we were measuring CO2 continuously and we were measuring microbial biomass and WEOC pools every three hours over a few days. And so the data look like this. This is from the A-Horizon soil at McLaughlin Reserve. Again, this is, a, this is actually an alpha sol um, formed on sedimentary rock. The respiration spikes very abruptly and then declines. The microbes show some measure of microbial growth over the 48 hours of the, of the experiment. And we see a, a very rapid depletion of the WEOC pool from this high level down to this basal level down here. We also looked at microbial biomass using the chloroform fumigation um, microbial extraction technique, and we measured trehalose pools. Again, trehalose is an osmoprotectant that's commonly used in, in, a, in a wide range of organisms. And what we saw here was that microbial biomass immediately increases by a fairly significant level, and then it recoils down to a basal level here. And trehalose is rapidly consumed, and the, the glucose that's released from it is respired away. So trehalose is a significant portion of what's causing the most immediate responses, or so, so it looks. When we'd done the work with amino acids, we hadn't actually measured um, trehalose at the time. It takes a different analytical technique. The B horizon soils that we sampled from the B horizon showed a very different response. They showed a very delayed response. Microbes didn't really start picking up activity until after about 24 hours and, and respiration rates were peaking at around 30 odd hours. There was a classic lag phase in growth where you can see the growth is, is limited here and then it picks up right when the pulse kicks in. And there was no change in WEOC pools in these soils. And that lag phase 
was just about 32 hours long to the peak in respiration. So the soils in, in the bee horizon, the microbes are inactive, they're passive, and they're just waiting for an opportunity to come to life. And by re-wetting them, we bring them to life, but it still takes them over a day to actually pick up their activity and peak out. The bee horizon soils that we brought to the surface and incubated at the soil surface showed a combination response where they show this initial spike and decline, but they also still are showing this delayed spike. The thing is that the, the that, that lag phase is shorter. Instead of being 32 hours, it's only about 12 hours. We also see the biomass levels overall are higher. And we see that weoc is still is now being consumed in, in these soils where all we did was incubate the bee horizon at the soil surface. So shorter lag, more active biomass. So that we're seeing very coherent dynamics in these systems. We very easily to measure, easy, easy to model. The kinetics are distinctly second order. They're responsive to both the size of the microbial biomass and to the size of the weoc pool. And that location matters that the environmental variation associated with being at the soil surface is by itself enough to mobilize microbial resources and to allow microbes to grow. So if when we're looking back now to start wrapping up this idea of the democracy of dirt, we can ask whether microbes rule, minerals rule, or molecules rule. And we have evidence that suggests that each of these plays a role and each has its own individual role in physical protection, in chemodiversity, and in being the actual agent of decomposition. And so as we're thinking about how we model these complex systems, we've historically done it using what I'll call invisible microbe models. And those have reached the limit of their abilities to, to deal with things. At the opposite extreme, we could build what I might call too much information models that are based on, on actual microbial community analysis, that somewhere in the middle is going to be some optimal design where there's some information about microbial dynamics, but not too much. And how much is too much, how much is just right is still unclear. We need to capture models that capture the right level of mechanism so that they're doing a better job of describing patterns and a better job of explaining patterns. Some examples of this just conceptually is, is from this paper, Microbial over Control Over Carbon Cycling in Soil, where there are different pools of carbon defined by their chemical nature, different physical processes that regulate the, the movement of those compounds, diffusion that makes those materials accessible to microbes, and then actual microbial allocation of carbon between detritus and exoenzymes and other cell constituents. A model that's actually taking this approach is the millennial model, which bases its pools off particulate organic matter, mineral associated organic matter, low molecular weight carbon and microbial biomass. This got the name millennial because it was developed initially at a workshop and we decided that if the old model was century, the new model should be millennium. And most of the people who worked on it were millennials, so it became millennial. Um, and it can describe patterns. So to, to wrap up overall, and my final conclusions are that we need to do a better job of embracing the complexity of soils. You can't just analyze microbial communities and think that that will tell you how a soil system works. You can't just pay attention to minerals and mineralogy. You can't just pay attention to the molecular structures we can extract from soils. We need to know what's available, what regulates that availability, and how that's interacting with microbial communities. This is clearly a challenging task, but one we need to find ways of putting together. That the questions that we're able to uh, uh, attack using these kinds of newer approaches gives us something that isn't applied science, but may ultimately be applicable science. If we want to understand things like carbon sequestration, these dynamics of where does the carbon come from when you rain on the soil, 
Is it mineral phase? Is it microbial phase? That's kind of important if we're worrying about things like carbon sequestration and management regimes. And finally, that a new generation of what I might call invisible micro models is, is the dream. It's not the nightmare that we need a model where we understand what controls microbial dynamics well enough that we can move back to modeling past the actual microbial communities to predict their behavior well enough that we can describe organic matter turnover and these responses to perturbation and to pulses um, in a way that will allow us to do a better job of explaining soil, soil processes. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have some time for questions, I think. <clears throat>